tape was in here when I got it. What? This is J.J. Burden, New York City. Hi, welcome to Seen It. The responsibility of putting together this material is fully mine. I'm Jack. I did it as honestly as I could. What you just heard was the opening line of an incredibly controversial movie that came out in 1961. But imagine anyone wanting to use real junkies just to make a movie. Controversial not only because it was about a group of junkies, but because it pretended to be real. I'll see if it's some salt, man. Give him a salt shot. People had never seen anything like this before, so they thought the filmmakers were legitimately buying drugs for the addicts in exchange for the footage. But it's all fake. They're all actors, it's all scripted. Believe me, we're not here for the money. In other words, it's widely regarded as the first example of a found footage film, which is important for today's video because I want to compare this to this. Alright, if this is the last thing you see, that means I, I died. Cut! Come on! Okay. Any place along the way, we had such a tight schedule and it was such a short prep and yet so exciting and I always was hoping that the chaos of what we were doing would like inform the movie and be like the chaos that they experienced that night. It's a lie! This is director Matt Reeves, who you might know from his Planet of the Apes movies, his remake of a famous Swedish vampire flick, or this little indie. But back in 2008, Paramount gave Reeves a measly $25 million to make something risky, something top secret. What you learn, what you suspect, anything you think you know, you agree to keep to yourself until the movie comes out. Actors weren't given scripts during casting, and even on set, they didn't really know what they were filming. It's interesting, we're trying to figure it all out. None of us have any clue what's happening, and somewhere in between, a movie's gonna happen. If you hadn't guessed, I'm talking about the wildly successful franchise spawning creature feature, Clover. <laughs> Probably best known for its viral marketing campaign, which used test footage and didn't even reveal the title, the film focuses on a group of friends who have to try and escape Manhattan when a giant monster attacks. Sure, it's a simple story and silly, and producer J.J. Abrams admits that it's kind of derivative. My son Henry and I went to Tokyo last year. We went to a bunch of toy stores, and I realized at almost all of them, Godzilla was still featured. And it just struck me that there was this iconic monster that still, so many years later, had meaning to the culture. But technically, I think this is just a special movie because the camera work is the best possible way to tell this story. Yeah, you want to do your testimony on that? Okay. Yeah, do it right now. People sometimes think found footage is easy because it looks like something a little kid could film. It plays on basic horror tropes like... The idea of anticipation. The idea of dread. And yeah, from a cynical side, of course they made it this way. Found footage movies are ridiculously cheap to shoot. Like, Blair Witch is arguably the most profitable movie ever made. Paranormal Activity was shot for only 15k. And even this, which wasn't cheap, made seven times its budget back. But this run and gun style isn't easy. You don't just point and shoot and make it up on the spot. You have to create a narrative reason for there to be a camera. Don't worry about him. We're just shooting this little birthday movie for Thomas. It's like he has to blur thing. lines with reality. Oh, have you heard of the Blair Witch? Oh yeah, that, that's an old, old, old story. And as JJ Abrams states, you suddenly can, without having to hide that it's video or pretend it's film, embrace that kind of technology and sort of use those limitations. In other words, if you're smart, you use what makes the camera special to help mold the story, like turning a light on, rewinding. Yeah, here, here, let me rewind. Using night vision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Run. Run. Okay, run. And in Cloverfield, this all feeds into the underlying fear that we all have every day that something else might happen at any moment. Go, go. But how do you actually film it? Here's one of the actors. It's a really different way of filmmaking. Very handheld, we're with one camera, so we don't have the luxury of shooting a master and coming in for the close-ups. We are having to get it all in one take. And back to Reeves. Kevin Stitt, our editor, refers to it. This is like looking through a soda straw, and that's what you see, so that the scale of the movie could be huge. Of a possible earthquake in Lower Manhattan nearby. But that because what you were seeing was just through here, it didn't necessitate getting the shot of what was over there. Or over there. Oh, oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, my God! So similar to what I discussed in my Alien video, Cloverfield is more interested in what we can't see. Or in other words... It enabled us to sort of play peekaboo with the monster. Oh no! Because of the single point of view, you can't see the monster as much as you normally would. And in fact, when you do, you can't do the six or eight shots you would normally do. But all of this isn't possible if we don't believe that a real character is filming the real action. You guys, I have it on tape. 
which introduces the next big problem. Which which piece of equipment is the camera? Is this it? Okay. Good. The entire film is shot from the perspective of me shooting, which was interesting for me to find out as a comedian and actor because uh, I've never done camera work, really. Cloverfield is from the first-person perspective of this guy, Hud, the main character's best friend, who has decided to film the attack because... People are going to want to know how it all went down. So there's reason for it, but TJ Miller isn't a cameraman, so how the hell can he film an entire movie? So you can blow it both as an actor and a cameraman. You have the opportunity to screw everything up for everyone two times. Well, the simple answer is he didn't. Actors do occasionally film stuff in found footage. We trained them before the, the shooting began couple days on uh, you know loading the camera and uh, like this is Eduardo Sanchez the director of the Blair Witch Project you know we just try to kind of give him a, a, like a three-day film school okay we don't want to fuck up the cameras before we leave but this is quite rare for the most part even small budget films will have a cinematographer pretending to be the actor that was a really cool scene like this sequence where the helicopter crashes because it had started out inside with a little, you know, sort of handheld camera that Matt was operating that was supposedly dangling on the string. And then as he pulls Michael Stahl David out, we switched it over to the uh, Viper, and Chris Hayes was the operator. And he was pulling Michael, and the thing was just swinging. And then he had to take the camera and lift it off his head and have it put down and then have HUD run in like he had done it. This final switchery reveals probably the most important pretense in this movie and found footage movies in general. As if we're really watching a raw videotape, there can't be any cuts. Or as Reeves explains... It was like putting something together in a way where you hopefully don't notice the editing. Therefore, we get flashbacks like this when the camera is being rewound and stitches like this when they move to a new set. It's seamless. But even with this great camera work, we get to the next big problem. The video quality can't look good, by which I mean characters openly state that they can't use a camera. Babe, it's not my camera. I don't know if it's the on button or the zoom button. All right, so, here, here. A lot of getting these cameramen who were used to doing professional things into the film was to get them to do things less perfectly. Reeves refers to this as method camera operation because they're used to sort of framing everything perfectly and we'd say, well, you know, that looks too framed. And whilst this might seem silly, professional camera operators cosplaying as noobs, pretending to be bad at filming while also capturing exactly what needs to be shown to the audience is really hard. Okay, you do it now. Okay, now you do it. Okay, now do it smoother. Now do it shakier. Which brings me back to the connection. With chunky camera work and this amateur aesthetic, both movies create the illusion of reality. We're supposed to think this really happened. And sometimes this works a bit too well. Like, this is Cannibal Holocaust, a 1980s movie that was deemed so realistic that the director was legitimately charged with the murder of his cast and crew. So camera work and tricks help, but this believability also relies on naturalistic performances. It's a, it's a terrible okay, thing. Let's go. In dramatic movies, there's a myriad of ways to elicit a natural response. Long takes to build a conversational flow, at libbing in comedies. What's your favorite fan grind? Green girl. <laughs> Eastwood famously shoots only one take to capture the most spontaneous interactions. You want to know what it's like to kill a man? Well, it's goddamn awful, that's what it is. But Reeves took that's it a step further. In this scene, I'd like the five of you to create your own dialogue. The actors on Cloverfield were given the freedom to improv in parts. The lot of stuff was some of my favorite stuff because we got to improv a lot and that was where you got to know the most about the characters. And the fact that a lot of them hadn't been on a film this big with these sets meant that their reactions were often genuine. And I think that they went with the first take when we were running up because we were all so genuinely nervous and scared and didn't know what was going to happen. If it isn't clear by now, Cloverfield is my found footage go. I really enjoyed it. It's not only a fun movie to chuck on in the background, it's also a great example of creative filmmaking. Set design, acting, cinematography, the marketing. Are you guys excited about the film? Does anybody know what it is? Like the use of fake titles. Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> it's called cheese. And even when things went wrong during production, the team still turned it into a positive. We got there and we had all these shots planned out that would use the puppet. Like here's Matt Reeves explaining the parasites before they were CGI. And the moment we started doing it, those shots look kind of goofy. We're like, that's not going to work. But one of the things that it did do for us is that it showed them what the creature looked like and what it was like when the jaw would come snatching at their faces or at their legs and they would see the claws and all of those things. So in that sense, it was a great acting tool. Which brings us to modern day. While found footage movies aren't gone, they're definitely evolving. Video cameras are basically defunct now. Everyone's got a camera in their pocket. And so found footage is trending towards desktop documentaries like this. 
These come with their own limitations and challenges. Stitching them together is an editing nightmare, so they're impressive in that regard, but I'm just not as interested in these as I am in the handheld style. Maybe it's PTSD from being on Zoom for two years, maybe it's the lack of dynamism of a locked frame, but honestly, I think it's knowing that this isn't real. It feels that much more artificial. Which brings us to some nerdy film theory, namely the word verisimilitude. In movies, this basically refers to the audience's acceptance of the on-screen rules. For example, when you watch a musical, you accept that people might spontaneously burst into song. It's part of the deal, it's what you get with the genre. But older found footage movies didn't need this verisimilitude. The internet didn't exist, people legitimately thought that stuff like this might have happened, and it looked terrifying. And while Cloverfield breaks this illusion when a CGI alien rocks up, Reeves' commitment to replicating the look of raw footage makes the movie, because it plays on our understanding of verisimilitude. Uh, I'm not here. Because naturally, we know this isn't real, but we want to accept this ridiculous on-screen fantasy, we want to join in on the fun and the chaos, we want to lose ourselves in the story. And if that isn't the sign of a well-made movie, then I don't know what is. Anyway, I'm Jack. I don't feel so good. This has been Scenic. And thanks so much for watching. What the hell was that? I don't know, something else. Also terrible. <laughs>